Hey YouTube, it's Anything Goes Saturday. <clears throat> and I have a generator under the tarp. I'm ready to pull some tools and stuff up to the house to work on it. I want to put molding up today. So I know I have everything I need up there to do the job. <clears throat> but what I want to make this video about real quick here. I had gotten some comments about painting the ends of logs. Okay guys, so I just came up to the house here. And you're going to see it for the first time. And the same thing I'm seeing. So this has been sitting in here for quite a while. And you can see the moisture content in this 2x4 is 15%. Okay. Now I would expect the molding to be about the same thing. And you're looking 14%. So, you know, it's all in that area where... Um, it's good for one another. In other words, it's good to nail this stuff up now instead of later or bringing it in right out of the kiln because now it's a, basically the same temperature as what we have in here. So splits and cracks and stuff like that and open joints should not really be a part of what's going to happen here soon. So I'm going to start working on this. Okay guys, so that window is trimmed out. Um, the one thing I like about the base molding that doesn't have a relief in it is that I can put straight pieces down there for the cleanup of the bottom of the sill rather than putting a 45 there. Now what you can do here, I know you probably can't see the real shape to that base. If I come over here you might. You could take this and turn it the other way and make this appear to go straight up. I like it like this. I especially like the fact that it's flat in the back. Now this isn't, uh, the nails aren't set there yet, but once I set them, every, it'll be nice and tight. But I'm just doing this because I want to see the mock-up part of the window of how it's going to actually look, and I like what I'm looking at there. So, um, this is one way to trim a window. There's, no, there's all kinds of ways. You don't even have to put trim if you put drywall in do corner bead all around the window, you can get away a lot cheaper than what this cost me. To be able to put this oak molding into this house, so far has cost me $12,000. And that's why I've taken the time to do all that cutting and buy the sawmill and everything else, because it would have cost me $16,000. I'm talking about the material itself now. So, again, this is the design. Um, Carmine, my grandson, made these, which is nice. We both did a little bit of uh, gloss polyurethane on there. i got to do the sills yet. I didn't polyurethane the sills because I wasn't certain of them. Not all the window frame openings are the same. Sometimes they're an off an eighth here or there, so I wanted to just make sure that I would cut them while I was doing it. But that's what this window is going to look like. I can see a Christmas candle sitting on here already. Got to touch up the little nail holes. And then I'll put another coat of polyurethane on this window. And this will be uh, finished up then. Have a good one guys. This is what you can do with your trees on your property if you have a sawmill. Or even if you know somebody that has a sawmill, instead of taking trees and burning them. I had showed this once before, I'll just show it to you again. <clears throat> this is a piece of red oak, and it's as flat as a pizza, okay? But, um, when I cut this out, I cut it out before I dried it. And you can see that it's split here, split here, split there. Here's another one that's just about split all the way through. In fact, the more I pick it up and handle it, you can see the crack is bigger there. Okay? All the way through there. So, what's the point of this? Well, the point is that when you take wood and you cut it into a final form like that, and you're trying to dry it rapidly, which is basically what happened is we took this, cut them into the shape of a pumpkin for, for decorations, put them outside on a bench and let them dry. And this is what happened to them. They took all kinds of shapes. I mean, uh, before, previous to now, both of these 
were curved so badly it wasn't even funny. Now this has a little bit of a bow to it in the middle, but it's nothing like what it was. It was so bent, uh, I bet you it was an inch high on each side. That's how hard it was bent. But it managed to come back and pretty much without a whole lot of, you know, grief. But it does have cracks in it. So, um, then I also have wood, like over in here, that I cut. Well, you know, this is pine boards. I cut these pine boards. They have absolutely had nothing on them. That sap you're looking at. Um, the board is made out of nice, it's nice lumber. One knot in it there. This is a slab sawn board. There isn't one check in this. All this stuff that's laying up here, I like the looks of what I saw, so I just stood it up. And not one check in it. Because inside the greenhouse here, because of the water system and all the plants and all, it keeps the water or the humidity high in here. So that high humidity helps the plants and stuff. It also helps to keep these boards from cracking. Hydroponics. That's the way to go in my book. Oh yeah. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine peppers that I can see on the, on this one plant, and more on the others. Hey YouTube, I'm gonna explain something to you here and go over something that I think a lot of guys will appreciate. So anyway, this video is about painting the ends of lumber to keep it from checking and possibly splitting. There are a number of elements to consider when trying to keep boards from checking and splitting. Now when we say checking and splitting, what we're talking about is the end grain of a board, okay? So this is the end grain your grain. We're talking about these little lines of separation that we get in here. These are known as checks. If they get too big, they're known as splits. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. So anyway, if lumber is dried at an even slow pace, checks and splits can almost be eliminated from happening. The key is what is to be, uh, what is considered slow and even. And from what I can determine from observation, I'll tell you what I know is true. First of all, I believe that all logs, all logs, when they're brought into the mill, I believe that they should be coated right away. In the log form, not lumber form. And I'll tell you why. After doing it, after trying to do it with lumber, okay, and trying to do it with the log, it's better if you end coat the entire log, okay, yes you lose a little from flitches, but end coat the entire log, both ends. It's better if you do it then than if you do it when you have boards. Because when you have boards, you end up with the possibility of getting paint spatters all over the place, on the ground and everywhere else. And yourself, you're better off just doing it here, and then when you cut this, the boards out of here, you'll already have them encoded. So that's number one, okay? That's one of the things that I believe you should... The reason's obvious, first of all. <coughs> Anything that will keep your lumber looking good is a plus. Anything. So no matter whether it's encoding or how you dry it, you want to keep the lumber looking as good as you can, okay? Whether you use latex paint or anchor seal on the end of a log, is only part of the question. But either way, you're looking at spending at least 20 bucks per gallon to be able to uh, end coat one of your logs. But the thing is, is if treatment helps, it's worth doing. Okay? So let's determine if, does this help and why it helps. Um, so like I say, is it worth doing? So here's what I noticed. It does not matter what you use to treat the ends of lumber as long as it, uh, as much as it matters how you treat the lumber to begin with. In other words, you can cut straight grain lumber either slab cut, quarter sawn, throw it on a pile with uneven stickers and 100 degree temperature and direct sun, 
50 mile an hour winds and 10% relative humidity, you could put 10 coats of anchor seal and paint on the ends of the boards and they're still going to check, split, and warp in a matter of days. So why do I say this? Because I've seen what happens to wood when it's stacked out to skelter. So the number one thing that you want to do is make sure that the boards are nicely cut and that they're stickered properly. You need stickers within three inches of each end. It's even better if you have it like a half an inch off the end and then every so often in between. What I do is I use one, two, three, four, five. I use five stickers for eight footers. You can do the math yourself to figure out how far apart I put them. Um, I have examples of kiln dried lumber also, so you know this, that has been end treated and still checked. And I have examples of lumber that is not end treated and does not have checks. So what's the right thing to do when it comes to end treatment? End treatment is a small part of the problem. The problem is removing too much moisture at too rapid a rate. Last year we had one of those drier years in recent past, and this year we had one of the wettest. So relative humidity affects how quickly moisture in the wood is absorbed into the air. Okay? Dry warm air will absorb more moisture than warm moist air. Now that makes sense, right? Dry warm air will absorb more moisture than warm moist air. So this is why you have to know about relative humidity. You need to know what uh, relative humidity means and what it is either in the kiln or if you're air drying outside so you can determine what's going on. As long as um, I'm on that, let me just give you an example of what it's like with this um, relative humidity so you can understand this. Let's say you have a given piece of air, okay? Let's say you have a cube of air. Now, don't use this as a way of calculating. I'm using this as an example of how to understand it. And inside this box of air, or this cube of air, you have air molecules. In between the air molecules is what is where the water is, okay? The moisture. So, let's say half of this block is filled with moisture, you're looking at 50% relative humidity. If there's more moisture in there, then you might be looking at 75% relative humidity. But either way, that's a good way of thinking about it. So, what does this mean? What this means is there's two things that can happen here in, in reducing relative humidity, especially in your kiln. One is to separate these air molecules. And the way to separate air molecules is to heat them. So hence, in comes the solar kiln. So if we heat the air, we make more space for more water. So think of it this way. If we took, if this was 50% relative humidity and we heated it, let's say the temperature went from 50 to 100, okay, or from 60 to 120, then we could get twice as much water. We would cut this in half and only have 25%. Now that's not a, a positive, exact, accurate uh, way of thinking about it, but it's a good way to consider it. Okay? So that will give you an idea of how you can um, work with your kiln. Because what you're looking at here then, um, you need to be alert to the relative humidity readings. 30% relative humidity seems like a good percentage, 30%, seems like a good percentage um, to dry lumber. And that's what I strive for in my kiln is about 30%. But how do I achieve that? Because let's face it, the kiln is sitting outside and is subject to whatever the relative humidity is outside. So here's what I do. In order to lower relative humidity, because I want it around 30%, and it's normally higher than that, very seldom is it a lot lower than that. It's normally higher in this area, so I'm going to talk about higher. So if the relative humidity outside is higher than 30%, and it's causing the inside of my kiln in the morning when it first starts 
to be higher than 30 percent, I can do one of two things. I can either extract from that cube of air, right, the air molecules, I can either extract the moisture out of there by using a dehumidifier, or, or I can take and I can separate and make <coughs> the air molecules separate themselves and give me more space to absorb more water. So the way that works is like this. A dehumidifier pulls moisture out of the air. You already know that. throws it out a hose. But heating the, heating the kiln, which is what the, the solar kiln is about, heating the kiln gives you more space, okay, a bigger space in which to put more moisture, okay? Now, if the, if the kiln has a moisture content of, let's say, that is higher than what's outside, which is rare, then you can open vents to be able to vent that and bring a different type of air in. Sometimes you can open it and bring heat in, depends on where the kiln is. Sometimes you can open vents and, and get moisture to come in if you need it. Why would you want to bring moisture into the kiln if it's already drying at a good rate? Be, well, at a, at a rate, I should say. Because too much drying causes the wood to crack. So you've got to be careful. It's too much drying. Now, can I give you an example of too much drying? I can show you uh, wood that has been dried too much that has the checks and cracks in it, or splits in it. But the problem is that all wood is not the same. So even though I have, you know, cracks or checks in one type of wood, I might not have it in another at the same exact um, uh, relative humidity or, yeah, relative humidity inside the kiln. So really you should be drying one type of lumber to get the best you can. Now that's hard for us guys who are trying to uh, get every tree we, tree we can get. Because I, in my kiln right now I have maple, white oak, cherry, and red oak. Uh, what else do I got in there? And pine. I think I have white pine. White pine should be dried the fastest. Red oak should be dried the slowest. Cherry should be like a medium. But what's going to happen is I'm going to dry all of these until they get down to a certain moisture content. Now sometimes you might lose moisture in, like I might lose more moisture in cherry than I do in red oak. So I got to be careful of what's happening there and how fast it happens. It doesn't matter if it goes all down to 6 or 9% or whatever you're looking for. What matters is that it does it in a slow process. Okay, so this is where you want to keep the relative humidity around 30% all of the time. So don't just turn on your uh, dehumidifier and let it run, because if you let it run, that may be the biggest problem that you could have ever, ever had, because you'll be drying things out too much. Okay? So, anyway, um, if the outer surface of lumber dries too quickly, so let me just explain this to you. You guys who are um, maybe painters, a painter should know this. If you put a coat of paint on something, another coat, another coat, another coat, another coat, and you don't let the coats underneath dry, the top coat will get cracks in it, in the surface of the paint. The reason for that is because the bottom, okay, is swollen because there's still moisture in it, or solvents, for instance, and as the solvents come out and the paint adheres to the car or whatever you're painting, the top surface will crack because it dried previously. I'll tell you something else that does the same thing. And you old fogies out there like me, you ought to know this. When your mom made a loaf of bread, did you ever see the bread? That don't even look like bread. It looks like the ark. If you, <laughs> if you uh, ever seen a crack down the middle of a loaf of bread, that's because your mom was drop, making the bread at too high of a temperature, okay? The inside of the bread was still doughy, the outside was um, too hot, and the bread ended up cracking. That's why bread cracks. Same concept, same principle with wood, okay? So with wood then, with wood, 
what happens is you're drying these surfaces here quickly. All right, they're drying, but this dries 15 times faster than the rest of it. This is simply why you want to end coat this. Because this dries 15 times faster right in this area. Okay? And if it dries 15 times faster and it's still wet on the inside here, this is going to crack. There's no way about it. There's no way to stop it. It's that simple. So after blabbing about this stuff, why end coat? This is why. Okay? Because the end dries 15 times faster than the rest of the wood, than the faces of the wood, right? And that helps to slow this down, therefore speeding this up, not technically, but in a, in a, in a sense. Slow this down, let this speed up, it will all dry at the same speed, and therefore at the same pace, therefore it will stop it from cracking, or we're trying to stop it from cracking. So basically, guys, that's all there is to that. Uh, guys, it's late. I have been busy all day. I'll show you some clips here of um, what I did during the day. I did some trim up at the house. I want you to know that I tried to make this video, as true as I'm standing here, I tried to make this video seven times before I could actually... I had to write it down what I wanted to say before I could actually say it. So, guys, have a good one. If you have any questions or comments, put them below. Bye.